Morning. Well, I don't know about you. <clears throat> um, haha, is it doing it again? It's going to do it again. Yeah, it's totally going to do it again. That's why we have these. <clears throat> I'm learning from my errors of my ways. When I was in, engaged to, um, to Britta and we were planning our, our wedding, I had a, a pastor friend who gave me really good marriage advice. And <clears throat> when he said, I'll never forget it, and I, and I, I tend to give it to um, any couple that I counsel when I do premarital counseling, and it's, it's simply this. He goes, one of the things that no one tells you when you get married, no matter how long you've been dating, if you've known each other for six months or 20 years, it doesn't matter. When you, when you actually get married and you get together all the time, and you're in each other's grill all the time, you're not prepared for just how much marriage teaches you about how sinful of a wretch you are. <clears throat> and that, that might sound funny, but, but I mean it, because I think we, you know, they're, part of the Christian evolution and the growth in faith that we experience as followers of Christ is we ever so more align ourselves with, with, with Jesus. And so when we start, to, we become a Christian, naturally there are so many facets of our lives that are not in line with Christ. And so as we progress in our faith slowly over the years, we surrender more and more to him. Right? And so logically what, what would follow is that there are things and ways in which we are sinners that we're not even aware of yet. And as we grow, we start to learn those things. Right? There's things that you know now about yourself that are sinful that you didn't really understand or know about yourself. For instance, I didn't know that I had anger issues until I became a dad. Um, I was never an angry person <clears throat> until all of a sudden I have this, this, you know, these children who are just so rebellious that just make you want to pull your hair out if you had any. But marriage, more than anything, it teaches you about the depths of depravity of your own human soul because it's not until you have someone living in your house next to you always there, pointing out like a mirror, right? And, and you learn these things not because the spouse that you marry is a nag that continues to tell you about how terrible you are, although maybe for some that might be your experience, and I'm really sorry, but you just naturally start to see you're confronted with your own mess, right? There's things that you were able to hide from even yourself when you lived alone, and now you have this person, and you're like, wow, I never understood that I was this crummy of a human being. I have some work to do. It's just a part of the natural progression of, of marriage. And, and this is, by the way, um, because it's extremely uncomfortable for us as people to wrestle with our own self, with our identity, with the things that make up who we are, right? It's not something we want to do. No one among us likes to have our hearts exposed, even to ourselves, Right? We don't like when we, when we do that. And by the way, this is why so many people in our world today have a problem with God's word. Right? Because we know that one of the very foundations of what God's word actually is, is it's a thing that will expose the depths and the mess and the sinfulness of your own hearts. The more you read the Bible, the more you realize how much of a wretched sinner you are. Amen? No one likes that. Anybody here enjoy finding out about how wretched you are? You read it, and you're like, yeah, I stink. Amen, Lord. I'm fixing that today. That one we're going to wait until next week. No, like no one enjoys having their heart exposed. And so it's, it's kind of a natural thing for the, for the world in the midst of sin, if we're all sinners, to, to kind of have a resistance to the word of God because none of us like to be told that we are messed up. It's not something we want to hear. It's just not something that we particularly enjoy. And in, in the story that accompanies our passage today, we're going to see how Jesus handles some of the people that are thinking this way, right? We're going to look at Luke 7. We're skipping ahead a little bit in, in today from, from, I think we were in 4-ish last time we, we talked, and now we're in 7. The Lord's been doing some, some neat things. He started his public ministry. He's been teaching and healing, and he's been teaching and healing in some controversial ways, Ways that make the religious establishment not so happy, right? He does some things where he heals a person, but he heals them on the Sabbath when you're not supposed to do any work. And so the, the leaders get mad because he's doing work on the Sabbath. And he's like, well, man wasn't made for the Sabbath. Sabbath was made for man. And he starts to do these things that seem to flip the establishment of, of stuff upside down in many ways. And so by the time we get to seven, he's really starting to jostle with the religious leadership. 
And the Pharisees, they don't want him to be teaching them because exactly for the reasons that we don't want our hearts surgically unpacked, they don't want their hearts surgically unpacked. And so this morning we're going to look at first the the interaction that Jesus has with them, the, the text itself, and then we're going to look at the story after that accompanies that interaction. Right? Jesus is going to have the interaction, then he's going to tell an illustration, which kind of drives home, and then he's going to, we're going to see that something happens to Jesus that really drives home the way that the Pharisees have got it all wrong in terms of their heart. And so this morning, let's stand for the reading of God's word. We are going to start in Luke chapter 7, verses 31 through 35. speaking to the people in general, but but the Pharisees specifically. To what then shall I compare the people of this generation? And what are they like? They are like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to one another. We we played the flute for you, and you didn't dance. And we sang a a dirge, and you did not weep. For, For John the Baptist has come eating no bread and drinking no wine, and you say he has a demon. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, look at him, a a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, yet wisdom is justified by all of her children. It's the word of the Lord. Have a seat. So the first thing he does is he compares the the generation that he's looking at to kids. They're, They're pouty kids. No one likes to be called a pouty child, right? That's not a good way to start a conversation. But Jesus gets on the Pharisees and immediately starts to throw that out. And we played the the flute for you, et cetera, et cetera. Here's what he's saying. The religious leaders of the day, they really are great at making a lot of noise, aren't they? They're good at talking, at saying the right things, at going through the right motions. That's something they're really, really wonderful at. And he's saying this to them by calling out their bickering and pointing out the fact that they are actually inconsistent even in their own logic. He's saying, look, you, you criticize everybody else. You look at John the Baptist who took a Nazarite vow, which means he never cut his hair, he never drank, he never ate certain foods. They're saying, look, he's not doing any of these things. He must be someone who's demon-possessed. So then I come around and I am at a wedding and I do drink and eat. And then you say to me, well, he's a glutton who drinks too much. Right? So like you, you don't even really know who you're critiquing and why you're critiquing them. Why on earth are you so double-sided? Right? He's, he's critiquing them for the fact that they are throwing other people under the bus And they're not even throwing them under the bus consistently. He'd be like, it's one thing if you just were angry at the same sins. But you're angry at him for not drinking. You're angry at me for drinking. What what is it that you want from us? Other than us to be exactly the way that you want us to be. Right? He calls their bickering out. He's saying that essentially no matter what the Son of Man does... And we'll see that as time goes on, no matter what Jesus, the Son of Man, does, they are not going to be happy with him, right? What made the Pharisees mad is that John and Jesus were going after heart issues. See, the Pharisees were all about the external, and they wanted to keep the conversation with the external. You are clean. You are unclean. You are worthy. You are not worthy. You have obeyed the law that we can see you obeying. You have not obeyed the law. We obey it perfectly. We do all the steps. Right? We worship the right way. There's no right or wrong way. We, we have the right way. You worship wrong. You don't clean yourself as ceremonially perfectly as we do. See, the Pharisees, everything is external to them. And so Jesus and John start to show up on the map, <clears throat> and they start to talk about heart issues. And the Pharisees want none of that, because why? Their hearts are a mess. When you're a mess, you want to keep the focus of the conversation away from the things in which you are messy, right? No one likes to talk about the fact that you're messy, do you ever get in a dinner party and you're like, it's just as long as we don't talk about this topic, because I know that I'm a mess there and I don't have it together and we're just going to keep the focus over here, right? Maybe you're the black sheep of the family and you're going home and you're just dreading the time that someone's going to ask you, so what are you doing now? You just don't want to talk about it. Right? 
because you don't want the judgment. They don't want to talk about the heart because they have issues with their hearts and they don't want to be introspective and they don't want to look inward to themselves, right? And so we, we see today in our culture the same kind of things happening. What the Pharisees essentially are doing is something that we see all the time in debates and all these kinds of things, right? If you ever were part of like a professional debate club or, you know, like had debate competitions, you start to become familiar with like debating doesn't actually look the way that we see debates on television, right? Anybody here actually part of a debate team and watch a political debate and just shake your head? All right? Yeah, a couple hands going up. Why? Because an actual competitive debate looks nothing like the debates that you watch for the presidential election, whatever candidate it is, we're not getting political here, right? They just don't look the same. Why? Because most debates today are essentially just a two-hour smorgasbord of what we would call an ad hominem attack, right? It's what happens when you are opposed from somebody and you're debating, and you have no way of actually debating the idea that they have set forth. So instead of attacking the idea, you attack the person. So I can barely tune in to, to presidential debates anymore today, regardless of what party or candidates are running. It's just so hard to watch because an idea gets floated out. It's immigration, health care, the economy. And what's the first thing out of their mouths? So-and-so is the worst. They couldn't possibly know anything on the economy because their second cousin is a criminal. Again, promise you, I'm not talking about a specific person, I'm not getting political here. It's the principle of the thing, right? This is what the Pharisees are doing. They don't know how to debate Jesus' ideas and the things he puts forth. And so what happens is they start to create a whole series of ad hominem attacks. They can't attack his idea because it's perfect, and so they instead attack the person. The problem is Jesus as a person is also perfect, and so they have to make stuff up. And if we watch the Gospels as Jesus' time on this earth keeps running, we'll see that the Pharisees continue to just find ways to make stuff up because they can't debate the ideas. And so they instead fight him as a person. Right? And it starts here. No matter what he does, they're going to go after him because he is saying all those external things aren't where it's at. It's the heart that really matters. It's the heart that matters. They want nothing to do with that, and so they go after him. As we keep reading down, one of the things we'll, we'll see is that the Pharisees aren't dumb. They're pretty strategic, smart people. And so they abide by the principle of keep your friends close, keep your enemies closer. Right? So as Jesus finishes that, that passage there, the next thing we see is that he is invited to dinner. <clears throat> Jesus gets invited by a Pharisee to dinner, which sounds like a pretty neat thing. Uh, it sounds odd, too, but they hate him, they're after him, they're trying to trick him, but yet they invite him to dinner. I don't know, it sounds like the exact thing that I might do. Keep your enemies close, right? And so when we look at 36, <clears throat> we see <clears throat> that one of the Pharisees, we find out later that his name is Simon, invites Jesus to eat with him. Picking up in 736, one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner... When she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears, and she wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with ointment. Now when a Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is, who is touching him, for she is a sinner. I've got a picture that'll come up, I think, on the next one. If I'm, yeah, at least that works. So one of the things we don't think about is we think of invited to dinner, but we really don't think about what dinners looked like in the, in the time period. If you were a wealthy person, you presumably had uh, a dinner set up kind of like we see behind me right here. Uh, it would be a wealthy home. They would have this courtyard with kind of the, the building that they lived in around it. Everything kind of centered in the courtyard and the dinner would take place there. And it was a reclining type of setup. This is way better than all of your dinners and my dinners at home where you sit on a dining room chair. They would have these super comfortable things, and you would recline. You would always be kind of reclining on your left and eating with your right. 
and your feet would be pointed away from where you were eating. So you can see all of their bare feet, right? And there's some things that we don't notice in this passage unless we dig a little deep. So this woman is watching this, right? One of the things that the Pharisees would do is they would have these dinners where they would have intellectual kind of high-level conversations, and anyone who wanted to watch could. They weren't invited to the meal, but they could just kind of stand there and watch them be awesome. And so a lot of people would come and watch the religious leaders debate things, and Jesus was invited to actually come to the table. And we're told that this woman comes up and observes what's going on, right? And she sees something that's really disturbing, and her actions seem a little crazy. She starts to wipe him, wipe his feet with her hair and her tears, and it just seems like something kind of out of left field. But the thing that we have to understand is she observes some things that are violating the most basic customs of Jewish hospitality. See, there's three things that would happen to you if you were invited to dine in a Jewish home, regardless of the level of wealth. If you were ever to come in as a Jewish man to walk into a house, three things would happen every single time. Number one, you would be provided the opportunity to wash your feet. Cleanliness was a big deal in the Jewish world, and they wore sandals, and their feet were caked with dust and mud. We all know, we've seen what the climate is like in this area, and they're just disgusting. And so when they come in, there was always a way or an area set aside for the feet of the guest to be washed. If there was any kind of level of wealth, if the person who was hosting had any servants, the servant would actually do the washing of the feet. So you would come into the house. Imagine how cool this would be today. You get invited to my house for dinner, and I go in, and and there's a person who's like, feet? And you just put your feet out, and they wash your feet before you ever come into my house. Um, I would love if someone washed my kids' feet every time they came into our house. (laughs) But it's a cool thing. So that's the first. You would have your feet washed. By the time you got to the table, look, they all have squeaky clean feet, right? No mud there. The second thing that would happen is there would be a kiss of peace, right? If you ever go to France, they do the, you know, the bijou you would have the the kiss of peace. It would be kind of a holy kiss in a way. That's just the greeting. It's a respect thing. It's the wishing of a peace upon the person who you bring in. And the third thing is that their head would be anointed with some olive oil. These things all seem strange today, and if I did any of them to you when you came in my house, you probably wouldn't come back. But this was norm in Jewish culture at the time. And so Jesus is showing up here, and he's sitting there, he's reclining and he's eating, and this woman notices he hasn't been anointed with any oil. And when he came in, no one greeted him with a, with a kiss. And certainly no one washed his feet. Those things are gross. And so she is simply doing the hospitality act that the host didn't do. And this wasn't by accident. You see, this whole dinner is a passive-aggressive way of kind of acting condescending towards Jesus. The Pharisee invites him in, but intentionally makes him feel small. At the table. Maybe he's inviting him there to impress. Maybe he's inviting him there in a vein of like, this guy thinks he's the teacher. Why don't you come sit around the table with some real heavyweights and see how you stack up, right? Whatever his reasoning is, when Jesus shows up, he shows him nothing but disrespect in the way that he hosts him. He affords Jesus none of the customs. And so this woman is simply stepping in to do the stuff that the Pharisee in his grand wealth didn't do. She's making up for his crummy hospitality. And so she comes to the feet of Jesus and she begins to wipe his feet. And it's a scene that is almost tragic as we read it. As she starts to do it, she just has tears And the tears hit his feet, and in her embarrassment, she doesn't, she can't find anything to wipe his feet with, and so she just lets down her hair, which is a a huge social no-no for women in that time period, but she lets it, she uses her hair to wipe his feet. How embarrassing, how demeaning, right? And then it tells us that she got out an alabaster flask, which is some of the most expensive type of ointment that you can buy at that time, and she uses it to anoint him. And all we see is the reaction of this Pharisee. You would think that he would say, oh, gosh, sorry, I forgot to do all those things. But no, instead, what does he do? He can't attack the idea. He's sitting there, clearly having been shown up by this woman for his lack of hospitality. Everyone there would have known that he failed to do his job and that he did it on purpose. 
guy looks like a jerk. Instead of owning it and understanding it and seeing that this woman has done what he should have done and owning the idea, well, he doesn't have any argument left, so he just resorts to ad hominem attacks. And he goes after the woman. What does he say? If this man really were a prophet, he would know just who and what sort of woman this is that touches him, for she is a sinner. Earlier in verse 37, it says, when she shows up on the scene, and behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner. This is a biblical way of saying she's a prostitute in town. She shows up. She's one of the worst of sinners, according to that custom of that time. She is the, the person who has the least amount of respect and dignity in that space. She belongs nowhere near that table, according to Jewish custom. And she shows up, and she does what everyone else should have done. And their reply is, <clears throat> if he really was who he says he was, he would know how filthy she is, and he wouldn't have anything to do with her. Let's look at Jesus' reply, starting in verse 40. And Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, say it, teacher. A certain moneylender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50, and they could not pay, and he canceled the debt of both. Now, which one of them will love him more? And Simon answered, the one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he kept talking to Simon. He continued to say, do you see this woman? I entered your house, you gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loves much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. And then those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Now go in peace. He completely and utterly puts this person to shame in every possible way. He starts by telling this story of two debtors, one who owes 50, one who owes 500, and he asks which of them felt more forgiven. And of course, it's going to be the one with much debt, which is natural, and the Pharisee answers right, and then he just calls him out full outright. <clears throat> he says, who do you think you are? You failed to do this, and she came and did it for you. Then you failed to do this, and she came and did that for you too. And then, you know, you didn't give me a kiss. She hasn't stopped kissing my feet since we got here. Is it embarrassing? Yes. Is it degrading? Yes. Is she absolutely doing the thing that you should be doing? Yeah. And you failed. And then he turns to her and he says, you have loved much. You have been forgiven much. And he who has forgiven little loves little. And he ends it by telling her that her faith has saved her and that she should go with, with peace in her heart on her way. Right. The message is clear. The Pharisees have little to no love because they have experienced little to no forgiveness because they don't understand their need of it. They don't get that they are fully wrong in their hearts that they might have all of the external evidence of good, faithful followers of, 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 the, of, of the way of God, but that they don't in any way have their hearts in the right place. And Jesus is trying desperately to point out to them that it's the woman who's got it right. But she's filthy. She's a prostitute. Do you have any idea what kind of sins she's committed, what kind of life she leads? And Jesus says, yeah, those who've been forgiven much love much. Anybody want to hear, want to take a guess as to who's the most loving person in the room is? I'll give you a hint. Her tears are on my feet. Now go in peace. All right. There's an interaction that I, that I have probably five, six times a year on average, somewhere around town, you know, whether it's a, a grocery store checkout or a, a car dealership waiting for my car to get fixed. Anytime I bump into strangers and... You know, I always try to see how long can I go until my profession comes up, because once it does, people change. You know, 
maybe. I was still like, how long can I go? I'm not trying to hide that I'm a pastor, but I like to just play the game of like, how long can I wait? And inevitably, one of the things that, that always happens when they find out that I'm a pastor, this is like nine out of 10 times, it's so common. The first thing that they will say is some variation of this. Oh, you know, I, I've, I've been meaning to get back to church. Or, you know, I, I, used, to, I used to go, I, I don't want to go anymore. Or they like somehow like feel the need to like make up to me for the fact that they haven't been going to church as if somehow I am offended by their lack of church attendance, you know, who they've never met. Um, but then they always give some kind of reason for it. And, and nine out of 10 times, here's the reason. Yeah, I just, you know, I just really need to work to get myself cleaned up. You know, before I can get in there. I just, you know, I got to get my, I got to get my life together before I go back to church. <laughs> and Jesus is trying to point out to the Pharisees just how deeply backwards that is. Right? Don't we feel that way sometimes? We feel like we've, to, to be here, to be sitting in this room amongst all of these people who you know are just so much more perfect than you are, Right? You gotta you gotta clean yourself up before you can come here, don't we? We kind of feel like that a little bit. We know it's not true, but we we feel it. Well, Jesus is saying, look, no. You don't clean yourself up before you come to me. You come to me, and I will clean you up. You come to me in the midst of all your dirt and all your mess and all your filth and all your sin and all your shame, and I am gonna be the one that takes you, that loves you, that picks you up, that forgives and loves much so that you can go and forgive and love much and show others how it works. And then I'm going to clean you up. And I'm going to take you and I'm going to change you and transform you and teach you and shape you and mold you into the person who, before sin entered the world, you were meant to be. Church is not a gathering of clean people. It's a gathering of filthy, dirty rags who desperately need washed. Welcome. You fit right in. We might look clean, but that's just because we know how to do our laundry and put on nice shirts when we come to church. I say this a lot of times, but if we could take the the life that everyone in this room has lived this last month and and throw it up in a screen in the video, no one would come back next week. You'd be too embarrassed to step foot in here if people could see all of the things that have transpired in your life. right? By the way, that's why we always have a prayer of confession. And and not only why we always have one, but it's why I always explain why we have a prayer of confession. Do you ever sit there and go, I'm kind of tired of him explaining every week why there's a prayer of confession. I know why we have a prayer of confession. What if we just had the prayer? No, because if anyone ever steps foot in this place, I want them to understand who we are, who we think we are, who we know ourselves to be, and who Jesus is. No one is ever going to come here and worship and see anything different than a body of people that are deeply broken confessing that brokenness and relying on Christ to make them clean. No one is ever going to waltz into these doors and look around and feel like everyone else is clean and they aren't. They're going to know this is a room of broken people that need a Savior, and that and that alone is why we're here. And if you're here today, I'm glad. You need Jesus. Know that he loves you and that he cares for you. Right? The gospel of Christ is that Jesus has come for the worst of the worst of sinners. For you and for me. And those who understand their need of redemption will experience much forgiveness. And out of much forgiveness comes much love. Right? I think you know, you know when, you, when you interact with people who have been walking in faith for years and years and years, you know, it seems like people who are newer Christians tend to become angry at some point in their faith journey. They, they tend to become a little judgmental. But as, as, as they age in their faith, that judgment kind of goes away because they understand that you know, they're, they're, they're in need of forgiveness and they have been forgiven of much and they need to kind of spread that out to other people as well. <clears throat> right. The longer I go in my faith journey, the, least, the less judgmental I feel like I get because I don't have the right to be. The more I just rejoice that we get to gather as a bunch of filthy rags unworthy of his love and just celebrate the fact that he gives it to us anyway. That he invites everyone outside of these walls to come and receive it as well. That's what we ought to be about as a church. That's why we exist. 
Right? We can assume that this woman has probably heard Jesus speak before, somewhere. That she's followed him around, that she has bought into his teaching, that she has come to understand what he's here to do. Because no one would act the way she acts if they didn't know the love of Christ. She would have heard him talk about the fact that as a sinner she needs him. She would have bought into that and she would have followed him. And, and the love that we see pour out of her, despite all of the social faux pas that she commits, is an evidence of a heart that has been truly transformed. Right? She embarrasses the daylights out of herself, and she could care less. She's just in love with her Jesus. My hope and prayer is that every one of us would get to a point where we understand ourselves and our Savior as much as this woman does. And that when we go out into the world and we, we live and we love those around us, that we love people as ones who have been forgiven much. Let's pray. God, we thank you. Lord, we, we pray a, a prayer of confession that are words on a screen that we read together, but in that, in that time of silence, we all, we all know what our own messes and transgressions are. We know the things that make us unworthy and dirty. And so we rejoice that when we confess those to you, when we submit ourselves to you as our Lord and our Savior, that you don't judge us based upon those things, but that you judge us by your own holy standard, that you went to the cross and died to secure, that we might have a future, that we might be reborn, that we might have new life, that through you, God might see us as worthy, not of our own doing, but of your doing on the cross when you died for our sins so that we might have life not just eternal life like a fire insurance, but an abundant life, a new life, a life under your headship where you guide us and shape us and mold us into the people that we were always meant to be. Lord, we pray for a time where sin is no longer a stain on this earth, where we get to be in worship and in awe of you fully and perfectly. Until that time, remind us of who we are apart from you and who you make us to be. And let's respond as people who have been forgiven much by going out into this world and loving much. Help us do that. We love you and praise you. And all as people said,